In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think that each of us is familiar with the old adage, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Certainly a popular adage, something that um, has a lot of wisdom in it. Um, I'm not exactly sure the source of this particular adage. However, I think that we can make the argument that this adage came from the Bible. That it was predated by something we heard in today's Gospel reading. Christ himself shares a similar message. However, with maybe some different words, and I'm going to liberally put words into Christ's mouth. If Christ were to say this adage based on today's Gospel reading, it might go like this. When life gives you manure, make fertilizer. <laughs> Interesting. We'll come back to that. So today's Gospel reading is all focused on the problem of suffering. The problem of suffering in this world. If God is good and God loves us, and if God is all-powerful, why does he allow suffering in the world? That is really the focus of today's Gospel reading. And Christ, as with most things, addresses the commonly known problems in our world in ways that we might not expect. And so most of us, when we think about suffering in this world, the problem comes because we're looking at the world through a paradigm of karma. If you do good things in your life, then good things will happen to you. If you do bad things in your life, then bad things will happen to you. The problem becomes, what about all the people who do wonderful things throughout their lives and get nothing but suffering, and the people who do horrific things in their lives and get nothing but blessings. The world does not seem to operate in the way we would like. And so, Christ in today's Gospel reading addresses two types of suffering that we see. We can, in a sense, categorize all suffering into two buckets. The first bucket is suffering that is caused by human action, that is intentionally inflicted from one person to another. And we see Christ addressing this type of suffering with a contemporary event of the times. Um, we don't know much about this event other than what we hear in the Gospels, but the way that it's portrayed in the Gospels is that um, Pilate, who was the ruler of the empire, who was the governor of this portion, Judea, the, the portion of the uh, Roman Empire where Jesus would have found himself, Pilate, for some reason or another, um, ended up slaughtering a group called the Galileans, members of this group called the Galileans. And it seems that somehow this killing that he did was connected with their regular um, sacrifices that they did according to their religion. That kind of out of nowhere, Pilate comes in order to make a political st statement and slaughters these people for no good reason. And so Christ asks a question. He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than other Galileans? He says, I tell you no. Okay, so he's at first addressing this question of karma. Do you think that these people were killed because they were getting what they deserved? That karma was working its way out and that they had sinned in their life so much that they were being punished. And Christ says very clearly, no, that's not how the world works. But he follows it up with something curious. He says, but unless you repent you likewise will perish. Strange, not what we would expect Christ to say. So I said that there are two categories, two buckets of suffering. The second bucket, if the first bucket is human-caused suffering, we also have in this world a lot of suffering that seems random, that seems accidental, that seems like it's a fluke, that we can't directly connect with any sort of human action. So. Suffering that's caused not by human action, but simply by what we might call fate. Okay. And so Christ addresses this type of suffering with another example, another contemporary example of his times. Um, there was some tower, again, we, we know about this because of the gospel reading, but not much else about it. That there was a tower in a place called Siloam that apparently was not constructed properly, and it fell, toppled over, and 18 people were killed from this tragedy. Something that seems like a fluke. Something that seems like an accident. 
Um, of course, the people who were building the tower didn't intentionally build it in a way where they were hoping that it might fall. It just happened. A fluke. He asks the same question. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all others who dwelt in Jerusalem? Do you think that they got what they deserved? That they had done something early in their life that the universe was punishing them for? He says very plainly, I tell you no. Karma does not exist. The world is unfair as we see it. Christ really addresses reality, I think, in a profound way with these two examples. But again, just like with the last example, he gives a curious addition. He says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Why? Why is Christ now taking these two examples and applying it to his listeners? Why is he saying that, yes, these two things had nothing to do with any of the actions that these individuals took in their life? They unfairly received um, this, this horrible treatment. And yet, unless you yourselves repent of your sin, you're going to end up like them. Kind of weird. Okay, so again, the entire question that Christ is addressing here is the question of suffering. Why do we suffer in this world? And so, in dealing with suffering, Christ seems to be connecting our suffering with our relationship with God, but not in a direct way. It's not that I do bad things and therefore God punishes me, or I do good things and therefore God rewards me. However, what Christ is pointing to here is that all of us in this life, if we do not have God in our lives, if we do not have Christ in our lives, if we do not live for the world to come, whether we suffer today or tomorrow or the next day or in 20 years, we're all ultimately going to die. So that what he's doing here is he's flipping the question on its head. The question of why does this person suffer or that person suffer isn't really a good question. What actually is the case is that all of us one day will suffer death. All of us one day will end up suffering something that seems utterly unjust and unfair. That's the real question. The real question is, is this life just one big joke? Are we just kind of here bumbling around for 5, 10, 15, 80, or 90 years if we're lucky, just to all end up as warm food? Is that what this is all about? So Christ flips this question on its head. Unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. Start asking a better question. How do I live in my life in a way where ultimate suffering and ultimate defeat that this world has to offer is overcome? And his solution to this suffering, this ultimate suffering, is what's called repentance. And the word that's used in Armenian for this word repentance is ab asharutyun. Ab asharutyun. This is a compound word, so ab makes it negative. And this word, the second part of it, which a lot of times is misunderstood, is the word ashhar. We have two words ashhar in Armenian. We have ashhar with a hole at the end of it, ashhar, that's the world. And we have a word ashhar without the hole at the end, which means lamentation. So our word ab ashhar utun means turning away from mourning, from lamentation. Our act of repenting as Christians is turning away from the sorrow that this world has to offer and turning our attention toward God, toward the source of all goodness and life and love and all the things that matter in this world. Repentance is not a formal action that we go through and the, the priest says a magic formula during the, the Badarak and you're, and you're clean of all of your sins. No. Repentance, Abash Harutun, is our action of turning back toward what matters. That no matter what suffering this world has to give us, if we turn and we face life itself, life himself, then there's no suffering in this world that can ultimately triumph. Ab This is the answer that Christ gives to suffering in this world. That these sufferings that are real and that are deep and that wound us, all of them, and ones that we don't even acknowledge, all of them ultimately have the opportunity to be turned around if we can make the choice to turn toward God, direct our lives toward Him, 
And so this transformation from suffering to a sort of joy, even in the midst of the worst that life has to offer, is a peculiar feature that the Christian is supposed to strive for. We see this kind of throughout Scripture in, in some interesting ways. One of the most obvious ways is in St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, when he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. It's not simply I grin and bear them. I rejoice in my sufferings. Why would you rejoice in your sufferings? What does he go on to say? He says that these sufferings, the things that he's experienced throughout his ministry as an apostle of, 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 of the gospel, are all to serve that divine office. That's what he describes as a divine office. And that ultimately, suffering in order to make the word of God fully known to you, my students, it's worth it. Because it's ultimately serving what he calls the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now may manifest to you. Now, ultimately, St. Paul's mission of serving, of giving of himself, of sacrificing, ultimately is worth it. Ultimately is not suffering. It's ultimately joy. Why? Because he has the opportunity to bring others into the joy of the gospel. So no suffering that he could endure in his life is seen by him as suffering. It's seen as joy. It's seen as joy because he's living in the ultimate joy that is God himself. Another example in the Gospels um, concerning this question of karma. Um, this comes from the Gospel according to John, and we hear a very interesting question asked um, to, to, to Christ. Um, a man was brought in front of Christ who had been blind from birth. Um, he was born blind, and the question became, Rabbi, who sinned? Who was the person to blame for the fact that this child was blind? Was it the child, or was it his parents? Right? We, we might say this, right, especially when a child is, is, is born um, in a way that isn't healthy. We have um, some, some new grandparents that are sitting right here, and from what I've heard, their grandchildren are nice and healthy, but what about for those who um, have children and they're born with some sort of a, a, a horrific deformity or handicap, right? We try to say, who can we blame for this? Was it something the doctors did? Why am I so unlucky to have this fate? And Jesus gives, again, an interesting answer. He says, stop trying to think of the world in this way. Stop trying to think of the world in terms of karma, of good for the good and bad for the bad. That's not how reality works. He says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Strange answer. That in some way the sufferings that we undergo in our lives can be opportunities for God's glory to shine through us to others. That there can somehow be real purpose behind the suffering that we go through. If we turn to God, if we turn away from our sorrow, our lamentation, and, toward, and turn back to Him. That somehow our sufferings can be a way for others to see the joy of the gospel. A hard lesson, but certainly something different. Something different than we hear in any of the other religions of the world. For me, one of the most convicting things, one of the most convincing things in my faith journey when I went through a period where I was questioning, is all this true? How do I know that Christianity is true versus other religions, right? I think that anyone um, in, their, in their faith journeys at some point probably goes through, through this, this line of questioning. One of the things that was most convincing to me about the truth of Christianity was the response to the problem of suffering. Something different, something that we don't expect. That God himself takes suffering upon himself by becoming human and dying for us, and transform suffering into something redemptive. Something for us to ponder on, something for us to reflect on. I started my sermon by saying that, that Christ gives us a lesson, that when life gives you manure, that we should turn it into fertilizer. What did I mean by that? Well, at the ending of today's Gospel reading, we hear a very interesting parable that Christ gives in order to further make his point about suffering in our he gives the example of a fig tree that's planted in a vineyard, and the owner of the vineyard comes and says, 
looks at it and sees that there's no fruit on this tree, and he goes, okay, well, this thing is clearly valueless. We should just get rid of it. And the vine dresser has a very interesting response, the one who's actually tending to that tree and caring for that tree. He says, leave it alone for one more year until I might dig around it and put manure on it. And if it bears fruit, well and good. But if not, cut it down. Interesting. Why does Christ follow his, th this kind of treatment of the problem of suffering with this parable? It doesn't, at first glance, seem connected. They seem like they're completely um, addressing different issues. Let's go back to what we said about suffering. Christ tries to flip the question of suffering on its head by saying that the suffering that we experience in this life has the opportunity to bring us into the joy of the gospel. If we allow it to, suffering can be helpful to us. Suffering can serve the ultimate purpose of bringing us to God. And so this story about the barren fig tree, clearly this fig tree is not living the life that it was intended to, that it was designed to live. And so what's the response of the vine dresser? The response of the vine dresser is to throw what essentially is garbage at it. What is manure? But it's the excrement of animals. It's something that would be completely worthless in most contexts. We just throw it away. But in this context, the vine dresser who knows what to do with this garbage uses it as a way to allow growth to the fig tree. I think that life can be like this. That life, it can feel like a lot of times it's like excrements being thrown at us, right? It's like the worst things that life can possibly have to offer get thrown at us. And so if we just look at that, we could say, well, this, is, this life is hopeless and meaningless, and, and why even care? Um, we could get cynical very easily. However, if we contextualize the manure being thrown at us and realizing that the expert vine dresser is intentionally using this manure as fertilizer to help our spiritual growth, then our response to that happening is quite different. That sometimes these horrific things that God did not create can still be used by God to help transform us. Right? The manure is created by animals, it's not created by the vine dresser, but that vine dresser knows how to take this thing that's utterly worthless and terrible and smells horribly and make it something that can actually serve our benefit. That's what suffering is in the life of the Christian. Suffering is an opportunity for us to say this horrific thing that is not fair that's happening to me. It's not fair. Yet, how can God use this thing that isn't fair in order to transform my life? In order to allow me to see his gospel more fully in my life. In order to strengthen me and to reveal things to me that maybe I couldn't see I pray that each of us have the ability to see the manure of this life actually as spiritual fertilizer. In what ways are the tragedies of your life maybe being used in a way that can provide for your growth? And always keeping in mind that the suffering in this life is limited, but the joy of the life to come is unlimited. And for this, let us all accept suffering, just like St. Paul, with great joy by offering our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the vine dresser of our lives, praise and glory, with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, now and always, and unto the ages of ages. Amen.